You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Egypt and all these other cultures would take these animals and liken it to one of their gods. So why does God give this command? Well, God didn't want his people conjuring up in their minds what they perceived God to be like and make an image to him. No image, no idol could ever suffice in representing our God, could it? I mean, it could never come close to describing all of the attributes and the greatness of our God. So God forbid it. What is the meaning of the second commandment? Why did God give it? And how can we apply it to our life? In today's teaching, Pastor Ron will answer these questions as he reveals God's nature even more. Israel was always exposed to other nations creating images to represent their gods, but God wanted Israel to be set apart. In our lives, how often do we see others worshiping the things of this world? God still wants us to be set apart. Who is sitting on the throne of your life today? Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Exodus chapter 20 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. Hey, take out your Bibles and turn to uh, Exodus chapter 20. And uh, we're just launching into a series on the 10 not suggestions, <laughs> the 10 commandments. So here we are in Exodus chapter 20. Hopefully you're already there. And uh, again, in this journey on the 10 commandments, we're looking at the second one today. And um, really just a reminder that the first four deal with our relationship with God. That's important, of course. God said, this is how I want you to relate with me and me to you. And then the, the, the second half, the next six, deal with our relationship with others, how we're to communicate, relate to them. And so those are essential. These are God's top 10. But, you know, there's different people that will kind of put them in different realities or relevancies, you know. So someone sent me some years ago the, the Cowboys version of the Ten Commandments. So just one God, put nothing before God, no telling tales or gossiping. I like that one. Get yourself into a Sunday meeting. I like that. Honor your ma and pa. No killing. No fooling around with another feller's gal. Don't take what ain't yours. Watch your mouth. And number 10, don't be hankering for your buddy stuff. I like that, right? That's great. So I like how that could be relevant. But more than being relevant, of course, we want to obey the Ten Commandments. As I said, these are not the suggestions. These are God's Ten Commandments. It does remind me of a businessman. He was from Boston. He was well known for his ruthlessness. And uh, he had told Mark Twain, hey, before I die, I'm going to make a pilgrimage to Mount Sinai, and I'm going to go to the top of the mountain, and I'm going to read the Ten Commandments out loud. Uh, to which Twain responded, I have a better idea. Why don't you stay in Boston and keep them, right? So it's one thing to know them, to read them, but most of all, we want to keep them. And again, a reminder, God didn't give these to us to leverage us, but he loves us. He wants our highest. He wants our best. So we looked at the first commandment. We are to have no other gods before him. And so we entitled it first things first. But now we come to the second commandment. Verse four tells us, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Now, if you heard the expression, I think we all have image is everything image is everything and that's certainly true for Hollywood for Hollywood for actors and actresses you know it's all the persona and and hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent you know on on how they look and that trickles down to society and we see that in society today whether it's all the wellness spas now and salons and cosmetics and cosmetic surgery big business you know we we all want to how we're perceived but of course God's more concerned with what's going on in our hearts, right? But when it does come to God, now image is everything. God is concerned with how we perceive him and more importantly, how we worship him. So that's what I would entitle the second commandment, image is everything to God. And last time we looked at three points and we're going to do this for all of our studies here through the Ten Commandments. We're going to first of all talk about what God is saying, the denotation. What is God saying here in this commandment? Secondly, why is he saying it? What's the motivation behind it? And then finally, we want to apply it. So we begin with the denotation. What is God saying? Well, let's begin by reading it. It starts in verse 4 and actually has two other verses attached to this commandment. 
Notice he says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to the thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So no image. Now, when you first read the sec first and the second commandment, you might think that there's a little bit of redundancy, right? Uh, you, you might think that that's, that's the case here. They seem very similar to one another. But there is a difference. The first commandment is really telling us who we're to worship. We're to worship God, the living God, and him alone. The second commandment tells us how we're to worship him. God was concerned, of course, that his people not make an image, not only to another God, that's covered in the first commandment, no other God, but in the second commandment, you make no image of me and worship me falsely. You see, across the board, all the ancient cultures, and many, of course, still today, worshipped God all, in all kinds of ways, different gods, the God of the sky, the God of the moon, the God of the water, the God of the mountains, you know. There was Aphrodite, the god of love, really a, god of, a goddess of lust, or Zeus, the god of power, or Poseidon, the god of the sea, or Baal, the god of, of weather, and so forth. But they would seek to worship these gods, and of course, in seeking to do so, they would make an image to this god. And these idols, of course, were typically either carved out of wood, or they were chiseled out of stone, or they were shaped into a metal object. But God says in verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, right? But they, they would shape these images, listen to this, in what they imagined in their minds that this God was like. And as a result of that, they would often do so in the things that they saw, whether in the sky or on the earth or in the sea. And notice that's what it says in the second part of verse 4. Don't make in a likeness of heaven above, earth beneath, or water under the earth. Uh, the New Living Translation says, don't make an idol of any kind in any shape of a bird or an animal or a fish. So think about this. The nations around the Israelites, as they're now forming as a nation, that's exactly what they did. And they would create their gods in order to kind of, as an animal, in order to represent their god. Uh, for example, um, the Israelites were interacting, of course, with the Philistines regularly on the North Shore, right there on the Mediterranean. The god of the Philistines was Dagon. And this god was half fish and half man. And then you think about where they left, where they're leaving from as they're now receiving these Ten Commandments. They just left Egyptian slavery. And, of course, Egypt worshipped so many different gods. And there was the god of the sky. That's Horus. And Horus was in the shape of a falcon, right? And then you have Heket. That's the goddess. That's the Egyptian goddess of fertility. And it had the head of a frog, which you think, well, that's kind of disgusting. The, that's a fertility god? Well, because frogs are prevalent there in the Nile. That would be their fertility god. And then there's Anubis, uh, that this god had the head of a jackal. Jackals, of course, are scavengers. And Anubis was the guardian of the dead. So you can see how Egypt and how all these other cultures would take these animals and liken it to one of their gods. So why does God give this command? Well, God didn't want his people conjuring up in their minds what they perceived God to be like and make an image to him. No image, no idol could ever suffice in representing our God, could it? I mean, it could never come close to describing all of the attributes and the greatness of our God. So God forbid it. But you know, it didn't take long for God's people to actually break this commandment. In fact, Moses doesn't even get down from the mountains from getting these commandments. If you jump over to chapter 32, just few pages over there, we, we find that Moses is still on the mountaintop. And uh, in verse 1, we see that the people saw that Moses delayed. They gathered Aaron and they said, hey, uh, we don't know what happened to Moses. We need a God because Moses is, is gone. And uh, verse 2, Aaron says, okay, break off all your golden earrings. Hey, let's get some gold. Let's melt something down. And they did. They brought him to Aaron. 
and he received the gold from their hand in verse 4. He fashioned it with an engraving tool into a molded calf. So he immediately makes this image. And he says, this is your God of Israel who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now notice he says, I want you to know this is the God that brought you up out of Egypt. What God is that? He built an altar before verse 5. Aaron made a proclamation. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. This Lord is the God that brought you to Egypt. Now, in your Bibles, that word Lord is all capitalized. I'm sure of it. Capital L-O-R-D. Why is that? Well, whenever you see that in, in the Old Testament in Hebrew, that is the, the consonants Y-H-V-H. That's the name Yahweh. He's saying this golden calf represents the God, represents our God who brought you out. This is Yahweh. This represents God. So immediately he's making this image of God. You say, why would he make a golden calf? Well, maybe gold representing a royalty or power and a, and a young bull representing strength. We have no idea. But most scholars agree that's exactly what Aaron is doing here. He's trying to do what all the nations around them did. This represents our God. Did you know this is not the last time it'll be done? Because later on, right after King Solomon, so David dies, Solomon takes over, Solomon passes the scene, and his son Rehoboam comes into rulership. But Rehoboam becomes the king of the south. But Jeroboam comes on the scene, and he tears the kingdom in two. And it was prophesied because of Solomon's sins that Rehoboam would lose half of the kingdom, actually a lot of it, the majority of the kingdom. Ten tribes to the north go to Jeroboam. And only two to the south are now under Rehoboam. And here's the thing. It's a divided kingdom from there on, right? Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And here's the thing, though. Jeroboam so wanted to keep that power and control, he was concerned. And rightly so. All these tribes of the north, once a year for Passover, have to go down to the south of Jerusalem, right into Judah. And worship God. And they might celebrate even more feasts. And his thought was this. If the children of Israel go down to Jerusalem every year or several times a year, they're going to make up with their brothers and say, you know what? Let's, let's break this division. Let's be one again. Jeroboam wanted the power. So here's what he did. He's going to set up two temples in the northern territory, just like the temple down in Jerusalem. And he set one up in Dan, which is the northernmost territory. And he put another one in Bethel, the southernmost part of his territory. He set up these, these, these little temples that look very similar to the one in Jerusalem. The only difference is this. He set up two golden calves in each one. And he said, we worship God here. This is our God. Same thing that Aaron did. Trying to represent God in this golden calf. What a ridiculous thing. Now you can go back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. And we see what God was talking about here when he talks about these carved images. This is not an application of the first commandment. The first commandment is telling us who we should worship, the one and true living God. The second commandment is telling us how we should worship him. And it's given to us in the negative. You shall not, when you worship the true and living God, do not make an image to him. We are not given the latitude of how we choose to worship God. We worship him the prescribed way he has told us. But here's the thing. It's only natural to really want to know what God looks like, right? Isn't that true? Really? Even Moses, as he's on the mountain on this occasion, receiving the Ten Commandments, he says, God, I'd like to see you. Can I see you? And God says, Moses, you can't see me and live. Well, let me see a little bit of you, you know, a little bit of your glory. And of course, God allows him to see just a little bit. But there is that inerrant desire to kind of want to know, what does he look like? Children will even ask us that question. Dad, what does God look like? I'm reminded of a little girl. She was in her Sunday school class, and the teacher is asking her, well, what are you drawing? She says, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. Oh, really? Well, honey, did you know that no one really knows what God looks like? She said, well, they will when I'm finished. (laughs) I like that. But we don't know what God looks like, nor could we ever express all of his incredible attributes in an idol. No idol could ever suffice to show what God is like. I mean, anything that we would make of God to try and represent him, would it not limit him? And isn't that one of his attributes, limitlessness or transcendency? But isn't that what we would do if we took something and said, this is God? We would be so limiting God. There's no way we could describe everything about him. And so this commandment 
is forbidding to making of an image. Now, let me ask this, because people ask this question. Is God saying then that I, I can't have a picture of Jesus? Or what about a cross? Am I not allowed to do that? Well, I want you to know the, the Orthodox Jews still are and were back then very upset of Christianity that, that came along and started drawing pictures of Jesus and, and having a cross and things like that. But is God against art? Or better yet, is God an art hater? Well, no, he's not. Because we know that it's not far from here, from Exodus chapter 20, that God is also describing to Moses how he wants him to make the tabernacle. And when he makes the tabernacle and tells him how to specifically make it, actually in the curtains are all these cherubim angels uh, that are supposed to be woven in. And then on the side panels, palm trees and pomegranates. And then over the, the Ark of the Covenant itself, you have two angels whose wings touch in the middle and to the far side touch the very ends of the walls. It's very beautiful. It's very artful. It's very ornate. So God isn't against art. But he is concerned that we would make something, here's the thing, and bow down to it and worship it. Notice he says in verse 5, do not bow down to them nor serve them. So the issue would not be art. The idea is making an idol and a perceived image of God and bowing down to worship it. So you can have a picture of Jesus in your house. That's great. By the way, it's probably not what Jesus looked like, right? I've gotten some stuff in the mail over the years from charlatans. You know, they try to sell you stuff or whatever it is. Do crazy things. You know, prayer rag. Pray over this rag and God will answer every prayer you have. Or, but we don't know what Jesus specifically looked like. But you might want a picture of Jesus. Awesome. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, the problem, though, is if you're actually praying to that picture in order to communicate to Jesus, then there's a problem. Nothing wrong with having a cross unless you're bowing down to that cross in order to communicate to the Lord. Because then that is a, that's a false worship. Then that's having an icon in order to connect with him. That's the issue. That would be a clear violation of this commandment. Whether it's a painting or a cross or a statue. uh, He says, here's the denotation. God says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any representation in earthly means by which God would be worshipped. Now, why does God set this prohibition? Well, we've touched on it a little bit, but let's go a little bit deeper in our second point. That's the motivation. Why did God give this command? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God knows the tendency of our fallen nature to associate him in earthly terms. Whether it's with our hands, which some people have done, or in our minds. And and when we do so, we belittle God. And we inadvertently worship a false God. I mean, idolatry ultimately tries to make God more manageable. If I can create my own personal representation of God, then I can seemingly, you know, control God. I can perform rituals to this God to appease my conscience. I can entice it to uh, meet my expectations. In the long run, if you create an idol, you create for yourself a user-friendly God. God forbids that. So think about Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Her issue was location. It wasn't necessarily an icon, but it was location. She's arguing with Jesus, hey, we Samaritans, we worship here at this mountain. We know you Jews, you're, you worship over there, you know, in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion. And Jesus saying, the time has come and now is, where it doesn't matter where you worship. It's not about location. It's about your heart. And he went on to say this, you need to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, John 4, 24. And those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, among the many things that it means worshiping God in spirit, One of the most obvious things is it's obviously not worshiping him through an image, right? God wants us worshiping him in spirit, with our spirit, with our our true person, with the help of this Holy Spirit. But then Jesus asks this and mentions this, in spirit and in truth. There's the clincher. I'm worshiping him in the spirit, but in truth. And where's truth found? Right here in God's word. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. And we'll talk about that more as we move along. Now, in ancient times, here's what's kind of interesting about an idol, though, when we think about the spirit. 
People believe, perceived back then, and still do today, by the way, who worship idols, that when they are worshiping this idol, this statue, this icon, they are literally connecting through the spirits, through some spirit, to their God. That's what they believe. And so they might bow down to this thing or they might give offerings to this thing. And they believe that that image takes on the spirit of the God that it represents. Now, they, may, they believe they're making a connection. And the truth is they are making a connection. But it's not a connection with their quote-unquote God. It's connection with demons. The Bible teaches us that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 through 20. Paul is talking about this very subject about idols. And, and the first thing he brings up is, is about how they give offerings to these idols. He says, is an idol anything? You know, they get this carved image. Is that really something that people offer their food to? Is the food offered to an idol anything? And by the way, this is what they do. I've been to many countries around the world, and you'll find shrines made out to these various idols, and they, and they have food there. Like I've been to Japan, and you find shrines to Buddha all over the place. And I've been to them, and they might have some fruit out there or maybe some noodles given uh, to Buddha. I I've seen uh, just some sticks of Wrigley Spearmint gum. Uh, there's tipping Buddha. That's all I got, some gum here. And I went one time, no kidding, I was there. I just arrived, and it was, it was winter time, and, and there was a Big Mac. It was in its packaging. Just fre I could tell it was fresh and hot because there was steam coming out of it, and I was getting really hungry. And I was almost like, I felt like taking a bite, you know, and then just putting it back, you know. I didn't do that. And so Paul in that passage is saying, is the idol anything or the offering of the food? No, that's not the issue. Then he goes on, verse 20 says, but here's the thing. When people make sacrifices, they're sacrificing to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. That's the thing. So they're making this connection in the spirit. Yeah, it's a spirit of demons. Pretty radical. Now, look what God says again in verse 5. You should not bow down or worship these false images because I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. I don't want this happening because I'm a jealous God. Now, we see that term jealous and we think of it in the negative. We might think of times where we were jealous for something. Oh, I wish I'm jelly. I wish I had that, you know. It's like a little boy who wrote a letter to God. Dear God, what does it mean that you're a jealous God? I thought you had everything. Well, God is not jealous, you know, that he needs something, he has everything. And, and God is not jealous of us, of what we have. Really, God is jealous for us. God wants our best. In fact, God likens his love for us as a husband for his wife. God says in Hosea 2.19, I will make you my wife forever, showing righteousness and an unfailing love. Isn't that great? Well, God loves us so, so much. So you think about a husband who's in love with his wife. He is jealous for her love. In other words, he doesn't want to see another man in her arms. A loving husband wants no rivals. He doesn't want his love for his wife being shared with another. That is a holy, righteous love. That is a good thing. And God's not jealous of us, but he is jealous for us. As a loving father and husband, he wants our best. And here's the thing. He knows, God knows, that if we have a false image of him, that will lead to a false worship to him. And any false worship to him will lead in a separation from him. And he doesn't want that. So it's interesting. When you read the book of 1 John, the book of 1 John is like the book of love. I, the word love is mentioned so many times. John, this, the disciple of love, writes about love. He writes about all this love of God that he has for us. And then at the very end, the last verse, 1 John 5 and verse 21, he says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. It seems like it's just kind of thrown there. But what he's saying is this, any idol would keep you from that love from that love and his love for you because it's a false worship. It takes you from God. God wants exclusive rights. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron's series is titled The Ten Not Suggestions. This series is looking into the Old Testament commands that God gave, the Ten Commandments. If you're interested in learning more about this subject, we have a resource that could be helpful for you. With any donation to Larger Than Life, we'd like to send you a thank you gift of a copy of the Ten Commandments book. This might help further explain some of the things that Pastor Ron has been talking about here on Larger Than Life. 
If this sounds like something you'd like to receive, head over to ltlradio.org to find out how to donate to the ministry. We'd be happy to send this book to you right away. You may not realize this, but all of these messages are available to you in our podcast format as well. If you'd like to learn more about this or even download our mobile app, go to ltlradio.org. We're so happy you joined us today, and we'd be even happier if you joined us in person this weekend. Larger Than Life is a ministry out of Calvary, Houston, and we'd love for you to come visit us this Sunday. We have services at 9 and 11 a.m., and we have a midweek service on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please come be a part of what's happening at Calvary Houston. Once more, go to ltlradio.org to learn all you want to know. Thanks for listening to Pastor Ron on Larger Than Life.